now we have finally you know, come, to the, came to the end. Um, and we have gathered here really for the final you know, round table, which uh, the idea of this round table really is to kind of reflect on some of the ideas that has been uh, discussed, some of the issues that, that have kind of emerged throughout, throughout the conference. Um, we have four presenters or four speakers. Uh, and these are uh, Robert Ford, and uh, Robert, uh, Rob is a lecturer uh, in politics uh, in the, here in the department, um, in, in, in our department. Then Amy Eklund, you know her very, very well, and Didier and Mick, from whom you heard uh, yesterday um, as well. Uh, so basically, all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask uh, each of them to kind of reflect uh, on the title, so politics in terms of anxiety, or to perhaps speak on one of the ideas, one of the concepts in the title, so either politics, the time, <coughs> times, and the anxiety, and just see how one, either of these issues can be used, uh, or perhaps even abused, uh, for uh, political purposes, and perhaps to, to mobilize the people, the society, the crowds, or perhaps to, um, to, to, keep, to keep the people um, quiet, perhaps to kind of a, a way to annihilate uh, the, the, the people. Um, I'm going to give each of them maybe five to ten minutes, um, and we're going to start with Rob. Um, and Amy, and then we kind of more uh, reflect on the title and from the perspective of, of their research, and then move to uh, Mick and and Lily. And the kind of the idea is also that you all then participate in a discussion. So basically, we are trying to have a conversation after this uh, their individual dialogue. Discussion, right. not a dialogue. Dialogue <laughs> is between one and two, you know. So it's a conversation. Mm. But yeah, there we go. Thank you. So Rob, do you wanna? Um, sure, Sorry. yeah, should I uh, stand up? To, uh, I'm quite loud, so I, can you hear me at the back okay? Because um, uh, I, I prefer not to wander around with microphones if I can avoid it. Um, so, okay, to so just uh, introduce uh, who I am, I'm a lecturer in politics and department. I've just recently published a book on uh, UKIP. It's the first academic study uh, of UKIP. It's called Revolt on the Right. Um, and so I've spent an awful lot of time thinking about uh, UKIP as a political uh, phenomenon. Um, my background is very much in a sort of uh, public attitudes research, survey research tradition. I co-authored the book with Matthew Goodwin, uh, who has a background in more qualitative research and far-right research. So we tried to capture the two faces of UKIP, uh, the sort of uh, demand side in terms of what they were sort of picking up on and appealing to in the electorate and also the internal side, the supply side in terms of how the party had evolved itself. And so what can I say about UKIP in the context of uh, the theme of politics of anxiety? Well I think there's a few things I would say. Uh, the first thing is we spend a lot of time in the book researching the nature of UKIP's support and anxiety is actually kind of a good word to sum up a lot of what uh, the emotions of UKIP supporters are really about. Um, there's different kinds of anxiety. We basically pointed out that sociologically what UKIP are in terms of a political movement is that they're appealing to what we call left behind voters. They have the most clearly delineated support base of any political party in current British politics. Older voters, white voters, working class voters, Voters who left school at 16 normally with no educational qualifications. That is the UKIP support base. They tend to share all of those characteristics. Uh, and these voters tend to, when you look at what uh, their attitudes are, they tend to express a profound pessimism about the state of the world today and a profound anxiety about their prospects, their children's prospects, about how things are going relative to how they were. I mean, you can put these questions to them in pretty much any way, and the answers you'll get are a mixture of anger, pessimism, and indeed anxiety. Um, and this anxiety takes two forms. Economic anxiety. These are voters who have lost out economically from the changes of the past 20 or 30 years. These are often the voters who formed the backbone of the manufacturing economy of 20 or 30 years ago. There's a common misconception that the typical UKIP voter is some sort of barber-jacketed, ruddy-faced Tory in a sort of rural shire pub. It's not, not the case at all. The typical UKIP voter is an older guy who used to work in a factory in the Midlands. That factory shut 20 years ago and he hasn't worked since. 
these are voters who've lost out through modernisation and social change, who haven't seen any effective response in terms of how these changes are going to benefit me, and who view UKIP potentially as an outlet and an articulation of their sense of loss on the economic front. But there's also a strong sense of cultural anxiety underpinning UKIP support. I'm sure you will have all seen the very high profile arguments there are about the degree of racism, xenophobia in UKIP support, and there's no denying that there is a big element of that in part of the UKIP support base. But the cultural anxiety is broader than that. It's a sense that the society is changing in a way that these voters don't recognise and that they don't like. They hearken back to a different Britain where they had secure work and where most of the people that they would meet every day looked and sounded like them. They associate the changes that have come since with a decline in their position in society. Their anxiety is, the Britain I remember, the Britain where I had a role is gone, and the Britain that I'm living in now is not one where I have a role. So that is the kind of thing that you could pick up on in the, on the demand side. But then how do they speak to these anxieties? Well, in general, the nature of the UKIP appeal is strongly nostalgic. These voters feel that change is lost, so what UKIP do is point backwards and in some sense imply that, that the world that, that these voters had could be restored in some sense. So there's a very strong element of nostalgia in UKIP's uh, electoral appeals and UKIP's the symbolism that UKIP's using. And also there's a, a strong appeal to a form of nationalism that is not really relevant to the young voters of today in Britain, but which is strongly resonant to, to older voters. Now that nationalism often sort of segues in to uh, xenophobia and intolerance, but it also features a degree of sort of assertiveness about identity which younger generations of voters are not comfortable with. Younger generations of voters take a much more uh, um, sort of nuanced and uh, debated view about what Britishness is. Older voters find that discomforting. Uh, they like a simpler, more assertive set of nationalist symbols, and UKIP uh, supplies that, that, that sort of set of symbols. So that's what UKIP does to articulate these kinds of anxieties. But the, other, the third thing I wanted to say is that it's not like UKIP is an isolated party. Uh, this sort of uh, phenomenon of radical right-wing parties mobilising on immigration, on nationalism, on opposition to political classes who are portrayed as being out of touch with the values and concerns of everyday voters, those kind of parties are now appearing all over Europe. So UKIP is just the latest instance of a general politics of anxiety for this same electorate. Because if you look at the voters who are voting for uh, the, the PVV in Holland or, or for uh, the FN uh, in France or for the FPO in Austria or for the Danish People's Party or for the Fremskrite Party in Norway and so on and so forth, it's always the same kind of voters. Older, blue-collar men who don't feel they have a role in the society of today who feel threatened by the economic changes that have pushed them to the margins and feel threatened by the social changes which they feel bring the current society into conflict with the society that they used to value. So there is a general problem here for political parties and political researchers all over Europe that here is a large electorate that doesn't feel comfortable in the modern world and that is turning to a form of politics that very often drifts towards intolerance towards mobilisation of hatred towards outgroups and so on. And at present, it doesn't seem that in any of these countries where these phenomena have been around for longer, there's yet to be any kind of a clear, effective response from the political mainstream. And that's the final point I would make, is that the politics of anxiety that UKIP reflects also reflects a failure on the part of the traditional left. We've been arguing since we started writing this book that UKIP are not a divide of the right, as they are commonly portrayed to be. A blue-collar, economically struggling electorate should be an electorate that should be wedded to the left. The left originally mobilised their voters. It's there in the names of the parties. Labour. These are the voters that were the original Labour backbone. But now we have a left-wing politics that confuses these voters because it tends to be a politics of two kinds of left. The economic left message of redistribution, certainty, combating the economic powers and providing security 
is no longer the dominant tone in much left-wing discourse, which is instead focused on social liberalism, which these voters often find uncomfortable. And the difficult thing that the left has to face is exactly what is the correct response to dealing with these voters, their traditional voters' anxieties. Because what we need here is a much more traditional old left economic message that basically engages with these voters' concerns. But what often happens is that there's a focus on these voters' social attitudes and a tendency to regard these voters as beyond the pale. To say, I'm not going to engage in dialogue with these voters because I don't agree with what they say on immigration, or I don't agree with the views that they hold about Muslims. Now, that's a real problem, I think, for the left, because these voters have very complex anxieties that are not just about their views about particular outgroups but also encompass an economic situation that really should be a situation that the traditional left can articulate a response to. And in my view, when you have a situation where 15 to 20 percent of the electorate in every single European country, older blue-collar voters who are struggling economically, can't find anything in the, in the message of the con contemporary left that resonates with them, then that's something that should be a politics of anxiety for the left-wing elites, as well as being a politics of anxiety uh, for the voters who are voting for these parties. Thank you. Right. right. Um, so I thought that now, since this is our sort of last event at this conference, that I would try to reflect a bit on what I've heard here this week, and and mostly on, of course, that every paper has some some sense related to this concept of anxiety. But what, what I like to see as a trend that maybe you disagree with me, this is the provoking part of what I'm saying, uh, is that this portrayal of anxiety has often or is often quite negative. That it's seen as sort of a controlling mechanism. It's something that contains a choice and eliminates opportunities, etc. And I'd like to sort of twist this around a bit and see if we could look at anxiety maybe rather as a um, productive force and what comes after. Can we see any sort of positive ideas with anxiety? Can we like feel that there is anything like good coming out of this the anxious times, so to speak? And I would think that I work on social movements and I work on the anti-austerity protests that have been going on in southern Europe, primarily in Spain. And this to me tells me rather that if we see that there are new areas of control, there are new areas of surveillance, etc., there are also new spaces of contestation. And there is contestation. I think that it's important to remember that there is still a claim to these spaces from people that goes perhaps beyond the electorate was what I would argue and uh, trying to slip through these nets that the sort of governing of anxiety sometimes produce. So I think that it's, it's more about how we can see how we can use anxiety or how it produces uncertainty that can perhaps become productive rather and that's what I'm trying to do in my research and I think it's also, when I look at my data or the things that I'm dealing with daily, I mean, yes, we see all these negatives. We see anger, uh, indignation, of course, as my, in my case. There's fear, uh, people are anxious, etc. And on the other hand, there is also like positive feelings. There is joy, there is hope. And all of these sort of stem from the same thing. And that would be, for me, uncertainty. Uh, but, so if we have uncertainty, that could like produce insecurity and that could be a negative feeling it could be a fear of the future but it could also be hope of the future and that could also be a promise of something good to come as well and I feel like these social movements it's important I think to portray them not only as being angry bitter people um, because they are sometimes, of course, angry and very bitter, um, but also joyful and happy, and th this sense of community can be produced around these sensations as well. And I think that that tells us something about how 
anxiety that perhaps could be channeled into fear could also be channeled into joy and hope. And that this it leaves and creates a space for resistance that is productive. And I would like to think more about this, and I would like to also perhaps hear what, what, what people have to say about this, that where is resistance and what is resistance? Can we resist all of these practices that we've been talking about over this weeks? And where are the gaps? Right? Because if uncertainty creates control, it can also create a way out of control, I hope. Um, so the failure of the totality can also be productive. It's a positive type of uncertainty. And for me, for my particular case and for the indignados, I think that this is uh, a new idea of, of collectivity that can be quite nice, actually. And it's not only about that um, with, the, with the total control of the total sort of Cartesian subject that needs to act rationally, uh, is that everything we have to say about politics? And those political actions that do not fit that can, in, a, in anxious times and in uncertain times, also become political subjects. They can also have political voice. And I think that the, is this sort of defying, uh, the, this narrowing down of what political voice is, that that's where resistance can linger. And the indignados are doing this, I think, in many, many different ways. Uh, partly because they're such a dispersed and differentiated movement. They want many, many different things. They don't have a political party. I know this is like a dangerous thing to say now with the rise of Podemos, and um, we can discuss that. Um, but still, I think that they are very diverse. Then they're also, what I would like to say, an emotional movement or an effective movement. And, and then maybe people say, ah, oh, but all the social movements are effective and they're all emotional. And yes, this is true. Uh, I completely agree with this. But I think that the indignados have sort of made it their profile to defy the sort of I am the rational political subject that is going to do this and that. I can also linger in my effective politics. And then there is another uh, component to this which I find really interesting as well and which I work with a lot and that's the, the rise of social media and what this does to the political subject as such um, with uh, new possibilities of expressing yourself to an audience that you would perhaps not have had before. And this, I would have to disagree with what Bauman said a few days ago that online you only talk with people that you agree with. Uh, I think this is quite inaccurate many times. Of course, you could delete them and you could say, no, I'm not going to listen to what you're saying. But many times people are engaging with uh, not so like-minded individuals online. So I think that that's also furthering um, the agency online of, of the individual. So uh, yes, I'm interested in the productive resistance of anxiety. And uh, I'm not going to say so, so many more things about this, more than just stating my points that the, in defying these categories, we can find new ways forward, and that this idea of that uncertainty produces a drive for control, it can also produce this the gap by which where we can express ourselves. Um, so from anxiety into the future with like a more positive outlook. That's what I would like to talk more about. So thank you. Great, thanks. Thank right, so on this positive note, Mick? Well, I'm racked with anxiety. <laughs> <laughs> because um, oh, we just had two very eloquent, very ordered reflections on, on politics and anxiety. And, I mean, I came and wrote about Schmidt. That's what I was interested in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but having to reflect upon anxiety for the round table, and I'm thinking 
off the top of my head, I'm thinking on my feet. I don't have anything as ordered as eloquent to say as that. And a couple of things I'm going to steal and then play with, particularly, uh, uh, well, not just from Emmy, but I particularly like the connection she makes between anxiety and hope, um, but also Rob and uh, the politics of anxiety surrounding UKIP, okay, which, which is contemporary British politics. My first reaction was to say, well, was there ever a time when we weren't anxious? Uh, and we said to Augustine, was dreadfully anxious. Thomas Aquinas was dreadfully anxious. Luther was dreadfully anxious. And they were anxious because they had hope. And what they hoped for was salvation. But they were anxious because they weren't quite sure how they were going to get it. And we live in an age when we don't believe in salvation, and we think that's all a lot of bollocks, so we can't understand the sources of their anxiety. But it was real. I mean, Luther was, Luther was destroyed by his anxiety about how he was going to achieve salvation. So then I thought, hmm, yeah, there is, a, there is a connection between anxiety and hope, but of course different ages, uh, different civilizations understand hope in radically different ways. They hope for different things. And so the, an the anxiety matrix to which they may well be subject, so it's going to be different because the hope is going to be different. And then the kind of the Foucault in me just kicked in and anxiety, well, we've always been anxious. Yeah, fine. But Foucault would want me to say, which one? Which anxiety? Huh? It doesn't exist out there in some generalized abstraction. Already we know from Emmy's observation that there's some kind of connection between our state of being anxious. It's a little bit like scarcity in economics, it kind of struck me as I was listening to the presentations. Uh, the, scarcity is a principle of formation for contemporary economics. And then I thought, hmm, yeah, anxiety is a principle of formation for contemporary politics and government. Which one? Many. One person's anxiety is another person's income. You just have to look at the advertising audience eh? and see the things that you buy. And one person's anxiety, there's a reference to Rob's paper presentation, one person's anxiety is another person's political opportunity. OK, so which one? In addition to the idea that hope and anxiety are connected, I was struck by the fact that there's massive pluralization of anxiety. I think Augustine, Luther, and the rest of them were anxious about one thing. How can I be saved? And we're not. We're anxious about a million things, and anxieties get produced and reproduced. There is not just our politics of anxiety, there's a political economy of anxiety. Billions are made out of this, and billions go into the spectacle of anxiety. So, so anxiety becomes a spectacle. That's how it gets sold. And I was thinking, you can see that I'm thinking on my feet here. This is associational thinking. But, but if there's a connection between hope that's being sold to you, hope that's pluralized, hope that you have, but if you haven't got it, or if you're not getting it, or you haven't got whatever's going to satisfy it, you're going to be anxious. But then somebody's going to come in and sell you something that will allay the anxiety and fulfill the hope to which the anxiety is connected. But that can't be done without the techniques of anxiety. Somebody's going to sell it to you. Somebody's going to inspire it in you. Somebody's going to circulate it. Somebody's going to pluralize it. And that's going to be a spectacle as well, because you can't do any of that without the politics of representation, without putting it up there, advertising and so on. So then I was thinking, how would I apply not just Foucault, but the society of spectacle to anxiety? Because it's quite clearly, in contemporary politics, anxiety is quite clearly a principle of formation for government. We're governed through our anxieties. And anxieties then begin to become objectified as that which government either addresses or doesn't address. Or if it does address it, it's in a market for strategic ideas about how to allay those anxieties and which prioritization of whose anxieties matter. That's how you get governed. In fact, you can't be governed if you haven't got anxieties. You've got to have anxieties so that you can be inducted into a governmentalization that is dependent upon inculcating into you a mentality du gouvernement, which comprises your anxieties, not least not least this kind of continuous permanent probation uh, that I referred to yesterday. Your continuous monitoring, your continuous self-monitoring, your continuous um, 
you're, you're continuing to check it out. Are you meeting the terms and conditions of your probation? For what? For doing your PhDs. For what? For getting jobs. For what? For how you do your job. For what? How you get promotion, etc., etc., etc. Governmental apparatus of which we are all in, which we are all deeply implicated. Um, is that ten minutes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Uh, I'll shut up. Okay. There were the thoughts I had listening to our colleagues. Yeah. Political economy of anxiety, society of the spectacle, governmentalization through the anxieties that are objectified in us and then sold back to us. It's curious business is going on. And a massive pluralization of them. Then the question is, which ones? Back to football. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> Thank you, Megan. Yes. Well, when I read Politics in Times of Anxiety, I thought that I agree with the three terms, but uh, maybe on a different order. And I thought, why this politics and times of anxiety? Because I thought that I would do time of politics of anxiety. Which is not the same. Because it, it's not that politics is playing in the times of anxiety. It's more that you have a politics of anxiety which is related with specific times. So what time are we speaking about? That's the question of the present. And if we have a question of the present, it's suppose a specific history of the present. How do we analyze that? By continuity, by insisting on the contingency. And I think that it, it was really interesting on the first uh, on the second presentation that it's one of the key questions. Could we analyze through a continuity what will happen, or do we have the idea that you have contingency? And this contingency creates the rupture of the condition of what was the past, and we have a self-organization of society. A Cornelius Castoriadis approach that we have a change which cannot just be derived from the past. And so what, what are these relations? And of course, it will certainly de depend on when you say times, it was plural. And I was really interested in that, of course, because that's really important. And so uh, anxiety, well, uh, I have been always a little bit uneasy with this, uh, the choice of this terminology, because in some way, one terminology alone makes no sense for me. Uh, security makes no sense if you don't speak about danger, liberty, and so on. That's the same for anxiety. So that's why I, I, I have looked a little bit on the book of Corey Rubin, uh, which is about really fear and history of a political idea. Make the argument through a very interesting research about what are the relations between fear, terror, anxiety, and an ease. And so maybe the, the first thing is certainly that if you look at fear, uh, the terminology of fear create immediately in the traditional philosophy the idea of hope, of it spur the human action. You don't have action, human action if you don't have fear, John Locke, and so on and so on. So what you were saying is in some way to to bring back the traditional political theory against a certain exception of anxiety as negative, which has been set up at a particular moment in time. So that's, I suppose, what is, what is really important. And I think that, well, uh, I, I, I just draw on, on, on some notes uh, from Corey Rubin for the moment, so nothing very uh, he, he makes, we begin, he, he has done a little bit of these genealogies that Mick was speaking about. And he said, well, with Hobbes, we have a politics of fear. 
Ob speak about fear. He doesn't speak so much about anxiety. But then we have Montesquieu, and you have despotism. And you have these ideas that it's not fear in general, but it's what is a product of law and the violence of law. And why don't we have rights and this idea that the power is absolute? And so we have to do, we are subjected to power if the power <coughs> itself don't block itself. And then <coughs> it's only, in his view, with Tocqueville and with the idea of democracy that we can get anxiety. <coughs> because this anxiety is in some way distributed. It's not a one power. We become all anxious, and that's really what Mick was <laughs> suggesting also. And finally, Anna Arendt is speaking about terror and total terrorism. So in some way, you have a political idea, and you have a politics each time you use a terminology. And that's this politics, which for me it's interesting, because it destroys the dualism between emotion and reason. Because each time you go to emotion, of course, what you are doing is that you bring back, at the end, the hope of reason. And each time you go to reason, of course, at the end, you bring back the idea that the emotion, the excess, <laughs> will transform the world. And in some way, well, it's a double naivety. They reinforce each other. So what, what is the other option? It's of course two, of course, at least it's one line of thought which will say, well, what is important is it's neither emotion nor reason. What is the process, the practical sense, the disposition you get which will create this possibility that you have this kind of a, you are subject to a certain kind of politics which is related with the logic of obedience, of will to serve, of contract. And so it's going the other way that you may have sense. Um, or it's also a political spectacle. And I think that if we think about, the, let's say, the recent past, the very recent past, 20, 30 years, uh, by the end of the 1990s, and the, the end of this political imagination that the Cold War was the order of the world forever. Hmm? When you have this collapse, then you begin to have a lot of discourse, which are produced by institutions, military, intelligence services, police, and so on, which, which are saying something about it. And they come back to an idea which is McCartism. We need to think back about McCartism. Why do we have this? Where, what was the previous example when we had this time of politics of anxiety? Well, McCartism was quite an interesting time to look at. And you have a lot of research on that, which were not evoked so much. <coughs> Well, of Stato. We have a political style. <coughs> it's a style of speaking about paranoid politics. It's not paranoia. That's a language with a specific style. But of course, of Stato will say, well, it's always a margin, the center, they are good liberal and they don't care. They don't have problem. It's the people, you know, the populist, who are on that. And well, think about not you, but how many research or absence ab absence of research just play the same games and of shatter. Wow, what's going on with the National Front? What's going on with UKIP? It's just that they are populist. They don't think. That's why they are on this, and they are just emotions and anxieties. And the good liberal in the middle have no problem. Well, of course, Michael Rogge, 
say, no, it's a political demonology. The center creates a condition to have that. It's a condition of the survival of a certain kind of logics to have scapegoating people by saying, you are anxious. You are not? Well, we will protect you from your anxiety. You have to be secured. And you are happy to be secure. You are happy to be protected. So I think that one of the points in that case is really to come back to that. The one person doctrine of Rumsfeld, for me, it's not really a, a philosopher, as I said. <laughs> no, it's a propagandist. Is that the equivalent of Goebbels? And I don't consider Goebbels as a philosopher. The unknown non is a largely ridiculous terminology, but it gets branded by media. So what is interesting is to come back to the one person doctrine, where it's a doctrine. And then you have a logic which is, which is applied. And the one person doctrine is more or less a form of McCarthyism in a different way. And that's where certainly we have to maybe think and I would say one of the answers is we don't need security. I would have a teacher, we don't need security for yet. Give me back my freedom, or not my freedom, form of freedom, and I don't care at all about when you say that you protect me. I don't want to, to listen to that. And that's the way I think that we may have some form of challenging this discourse that the spoke person protect us and that we have to be obedient to them. Right. Thank you very much for this. Um, I think you have definitely raised a number of very interesting issues. I guess uh, one of the key ones should also be um, we talk about anxiety all the time, but exactly what do we actually mean by it? What is this anxiety? Is this social anxiety? Is this the political anxiety? Is this, uh, this our anxiety that really constitute us as political subjects in the first place as well? And of course also then, what does it mean? Are we governed by... by uh, um, our, is, is, is anxiety governing us or are we actually governed through the anxieties? How actually to respond or resist perhaps to this, to this urge, but also ultimately um, can be self-governing anxiety as to as 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 as, as political, political subject. So, any questions, responses to what has been uh, said? Uh, hi, uh, uh, my name is Joao. Uh, I'm going to try and uh, to divert the discussion a bit, uh, but there's something that's really bothering me, and that's something that we all witnessed two days ago that um, Professor Bauman's uh, speech was interrupted by the chanting of uh, all communist traitors will be hung, uh, hung uh, like food from trees. And I would really like to ask, we have uh, a bit of a conversation about this, because um, to me, I, I was completely shocked. Uh, is this, was, was this an anti-Semitic incident? Was this, just a disruption? Was this, what, what, what was that? It was just, uh, well, it made me very anxious, that stuff. <laughs> and, but, but I just, uh, I'm, 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 I'm still sort of shocked by it. I tried and failed to uh, move my own paper uh, and, and, and touch upon it a bit. But uh, I'm, uh, I, I'm really putting, really, if, if you have any, any thoughts about that, I would really, like to hear. I really like us to have a conversation about that because uh, it, 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 I, I think it left me physically ill too. It's, it's such a thing that me personally. Um, that's my question. We have any other questions, perhaps? Enrique. Rob, uh, very interesting, uh, and I would be most interested in reading the book. Of course, I think that ten minutes is. Uh, it's quite doesn't sometimes isn't justice to an argument, but uh, it, it seemed to me that you were describing, like in a very interesting way, this electorate that 
it's crying for the good old days to be back. But what it, it was, it, it struck me as a bit problematic that it seemed as if you were crying for the good old luck to come back in response <laughs> to this lecture that's basically saying we need to go to a place that the good old days back. So wouldn't it be a question of we think in the way we conceive of the political spectre instead the political spectrum, sorry, instead of just trying to reinstitute uh, the way things used to be. In my, <coughs> that, that's, that was just how we, how we got me. I'm not sure if I'm right, but. Mark, shall we uh, maybe respond to the first two questions and then uh, um, um, Maybe you said you want to respond to the. Yeah. Well, it is, it's less a response because I wasn't here um, <laughs> uh, for the Bauman uh, demonstration. Um, it's clearly making you anxious. <laughs> My, but I think maybe it's more than that. Uh, so I wanted to make a point. I don't know if it helps. OK, but I'll make the point. It may help. I think Didier drew a very important distinction between uh, the social contract theory of Hobbes which is foundational for our liberal politics, is based upon a politics of fear, eh? which is not anxiety. Eh? And the fear was fear of violent death at the hands of other men. And I think my reflection about anxiety was hmm, pluralization connected to hope, or well, different kinds of hope. It, it, I was thinking of anxiety as a marketable commodity. I'll, I'll get to the Bauman thing, OK. So a political economy of governance that's based upon a marketable, econ a marketable commodity called anxiety, yeah? which seems to be the way in which liberal politics has evolved, can't utilize the apparatus and the discursive apparatuses and vocabularies of representative government based on social contract. Yeah? An economy of, 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 of government distribution uh, uh, production, dissemination, reproduction, modification, and so on of anxiety. And political subjects as repositories of anxieties trading in the, uh, in, in the attempted satisfaction of anxieties. It leaves us without a political vocabulary for dealing with things that don't arise as anxieties. But maybe this is the point of Obama, I don't know. But as somehow fundamental challenge to those things that we either used to think of as self-evident or upon which we, we hope to found, hope to found our political order, which is not simply a marketable economy of anxieties. You know? And I don't know. And then we don't know how to respond to the way. Then how do we place whatever that incident was, which clearly was threatening, or maybe offensive, um, and maybe it was something you know, the people who were perpetrating it were trying to make a political point of some description of what was that political point. But it certainly weren't selling you anxieties. They were, they were doing something else. Um, shall I? <coughs> oh, thanks, Enrico. It was a, a really, a really uh, observant point, a really good point. It's actually uh, it's an issue that we, uh, we wrestled with a bit in the book, but perhaps haven't come up with uh, a complete answer to yet. Um, so I think it is definitely true that, that you know perhaps the answer to nostalgia isn't more nostalgia. Um, but I'll unpack it a little bit. Um, I think that what goes on with UKIP is that these are voters who 30 or 40 years ago were provided by the left with a very clear narrative about what politics is for. These are not very sophisticated voters. These aren't voters that pay a lot of attention to politics. But in the days of the old Labour movement, they knew that basically Labour was a party of the working man. The working man got a raw deal, and Labour was there to basically correct that, to correct that injustice. And that narrative has kind of died away in the past 20 years. And nothing as effective has replaced it in terms of providing these voters with a clear sense of what is wrong in the world and how their political activity will help to set it right. It's very hard to get these voters, if you go and talk to them, to believe that this is what the Labour Party of today is actually supposed to be for, or that the people who are running for Parliament in it actually represent, even though many of them do. It just doesn't seem that way to them. And I think that, that 
on some issues, the good old left may be the answer, in particular on economics. There is no reason why we couldn't have a Labour Party that ran more clearly and more basically and directly on the issue of economic injustice and revive the messages surrounding that. You are getting a raw deal. We are here to stop that happening and to correct that and to make the world a fairer place. The problem for Labour is that on the cultural issues that also concern these voters a lot, turning back the clock is not a viable option. You can't say to these voters, the world's changed in ways you find alarming and we'll, and we'll stop that. And part of the problem I've found in presenting these messages to, to people in the Labour Party is that they think that that's the answer, that they've got to move in a culturally conservative direction instead of moving in an economically progressive direction. I think you have to get these voters to accept that the world has changed in ways that they can't reverse. Well, at the same time, ref crafting a narrative that basically speaks to their sort of raw emotional anxiety, their raw emotional sense of injustice in the way that the old left narrative used to. Um, um, and that's not an easy task. So it, it's, 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 you need a new left message that has the same resonance as the old left message. It, it's part of the problem that they have uh, that the political vocabulary that historically Labour was able to deploy and utilize for political mobilization and institutionalization, cooperative movement and so on, that there the simply isn't a political, vo that, that the party doesn't have a political vocabulary available to them that works, appears to work anymore. And indeed they resort to it, for example, with Michael Fortin successively, uh, condemned them to electoral marginalization until Blair. Well, I think but that's is the problem that what Blair provided was a kind of consumerist politics. And that vocabulary works for a while, but, but it, it doesn't seem to deal with larger issues to do with injustice, mm -hmm. to do with the point that Didier made about obedience, submission, acceptance, deference to an order of, of politics and government, which for whatever reason you accept as being legitimate, as being and you cut it some slack because you accept its legitimacy. Whereas, whereas a kind of political economy of trading in anxieties is something else. It's a consumerist vocabulary. It's a consumption vocabulary, which is what, which is what politics has become. And that succeeded for a while with New Labour. But perhaps they can't go back to their old political vocabulary. It succeeded for a while with New Labour. Perhaps it only ever succeeds for a while in this order of politics, because the very, the very vocabulary of particular coalitions of consumerist politics, that, that consume themselves. They get used up. I mean, they work for a bit, and then they get used up. Yeah, I, I, think, I, think that's, I think that's very astute. Uh, I mean, in, in, in my course on sort of electoral politics, I use a lot of old YouTube clips of an Iron Bevan, yeah. um, Franklin Roosevelt, and you yeah. look at the rhetoric that those leaders are using. Roosevelt saying, uh, the, the, um, the powers that be in this country treat me with contempt. I welcome their contempt. I welcome their hostility. You see an Iron Bevan saying, people disagree with my proposals. Uh, they're idiots. Yeah. <laughs> there was a self-confidence about this is our politics, this is our values, and if people in the establishment don't like it, they can go hack. And uh, the, the period that led up to Blairism and the period after Blairism killed that. And you've yeah. got this sort of new consumerist. It's, at the same time, you know, basically saying that the, the, the new order is legitimate, we just want to tinker with it. Yeah. And that, that's an unsustainable politics yeah. for the left, because the left is all about saying that the order doesn't work and it needs fixing. Yeah. But it's, it's self-contradictory to say the order, the order does work, but it needs fixing. Yeah. And so it, le it left the left without a compelling story to tell to people, yeah. I think. I mean, I looked at um, Eisenhower's farewell address and was teaching it to some students last year. Well, I wasn't teaching it, you just show it. And what I was, just, I had exactly the same response to Eisenhower's farewell address. You know, the famous one, uh, which includes the condemnation of the development in the United States of a military industrial complex. And I, I, it, it's on YouTube, which is, which is a wonderful institution. And the students were just shocked by what? by the sheer radicalness of what Eisenhower was saying. And, and it's political, um, it, it, it's, it's, you know, it's coming from uh, a very deep-rooted 
sense of American republicanism, uh, you know, that goes back 200 years. And they were shocked by it. Uh, but it doesn't work anymore. Well, we don't know if it would. No one tries. <laughs> 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 do you have yeah. any yeah. other interventions, yeah. perhaps, on this the same topic? Or did you have any joint response on um, this? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I mean, I think it's just perhaps a, a lack of the strong narrative. I mean, I completely agree with this, um, and I would see that in my research as well. It's also a lack of a hegemonic narrative. So in that sense, it's not necessarily a, a, a bad, or for the left, uh, I would say, and that becoming then that politics has become technocratic and a, like expert rule, all these things. I think it deters people from investing in it, mm. and this is just my, and there is no investment in a signifier, and whatever that would be, is it like take out all the migrants or is it equality for all, uh, whichever. So that would be my, my two cents, the lack, the lack of the signifier mm. and the emotional investments. Well, maybe to come back to to the event with Zygmunt Bauman, I think that one of the things is why they have done that. They have done that to create what? That we speak about it. That we fear to speak about it and to have this kind of elements. So you have, a, you have always a possibility to say, does it matter, really? Because in some way, the first thing, well, Montaigne said the thing I fear most is fear. And you know this phrase by heart. But he gives the answer, of course, of that. But he gives the answer in a very prudent way. And 120 pages later, which of course, was never on Roosevelt's discourse when he quoted Montaigne, because certainly 120 pages, uh, and in a very difficult way to, uh, to understand that if the answer was not on his straightforward way of thinking. And he said, well, we need to have the courage to love. Next time we see people like that, the best answer is everybody laughing to them. And then they are obliged to go to violence or to leave. And that's one of the ideas that Montaigne has developed. It's a different form of courage. It's not going against the violence. It's not repeating the mimesis of it. Or afterwards to come back and to say, oh, we didn't enter into dialogue with them. Of course, yes, I hope so. So that's my my take on it. You see. Does any of this make any contribution to <laughs> giving formation or expression to the the care, anxiety, or worry, or confusion that you had about that incident? And not much, really. I, 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 I'm not convinced this had no risk of being violent. Uh, and I was surprised at how little this uh, event is featured in the conversation, just to understand it. Um, I didn't understand at first, I don't speak Polish. Uh, Stuff later, that's when I was really shocked. Again, it's an 88 year old man at this moment. Poland is a new and, and, and chance in his face that he would be, should be hung. It's just not something that I'm used to or can, or can deal with. And I was sort of hoping other people feel the same. Mm. But uh, I just, I, I don't, res I didn't respond to it, and I can't respond to it in, in, in a similar way. I, I, it just, it's still, it's still there, 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 Okay, we've got a few more other questions. So, um, Norma, I have a question. Yes, <clears throat> thank you. 
and it was just a flaw on Enrique's point. Uh, I was just thinking to which extent taking, um, talking about the keep or other kind of these parties as an insurgency or a revolt in a way conceals how these parties have been at least co-constituting their political agenda in many aspects with the media. Um, looking about like, looking about immigration, for example, and how much Cameron has used um, this kind of position to actually boost its own position. So to which extent talking about not putting them in a relation but actually talking about you keep them separate as a report, as an opposition, conceals the politics of anxiety and actually the politicized issue reproducing the mainstream part of this discourse. Oh, thank you. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is turned on. Uh, I think it was uh, Didier made the point about times, plural, times of anxiety. Seems to me that one of the other um, dimensions of the title of the conference is the potential for pluralizing anxiety to anxieties. And that one of the anxieties that is contemporary is the anxiety over the, over the past, never mind the anxiety over the present. And that in some societies, post-conflict societies, there has been an attempt to reconcile with the past by going through a um, truth and reconciliation process, such as has happened post-apartheid in South Africa. But post-conflict and the examination of truth in times of conflict raises tremendous anxieties. And we've seen it in recent years in Spain where the Zapatero government attempted to allow much more debate and in fact effectively to eliminate the Pacto del Olvido, the Pacto of, of, of the Pacto of Forgetting about incidents that happened in the immediate post Civil War years in Spain. And in many other countries too where there is a history of conflict and that more or less means every country, there are huge anxieties about facing truth. And so to me, this is, if we take Poland as a post-conflict society, or Italy as a post-conflict society, you still see the juggernauts of left and right in the war that tore Europe apart between 1939 and 45 as unfinished business. And for me, the greatest anxiety at the current time is the loss of direction of the European project, because in order for us to retain the hope that I think Emmy, Emmy very usefully articulated that out of anxiety we have to discover hope, there needs to be some way forward for that European project to reconcile us with the past and give us hope for the future. I don't know if anybody would like to comment on that. Thank you. Actually, I perhaps could have a few more uh, comments. Are there any? Well, I'd, I'd, I'd like to heavily reinforce that. I think that's absolutely right, <laughs> partly because of my age, um, <laughs> being a child of the post-war period and an enthusiast of the European project in my youth, and then to see it lose direction, fall into uh, corruption and diffusion and uh, uh, loss of faith. And that, that disguises the fact that for a very, very important and significant period, it actually did contribute towards the peace and reconciliation politically, without which you know, we wouldn't have enjoyed uh, the, uh, the kind of domestic and international tranquility within the Western part of Europe yeah. uh, that we did for you know, 40, 50 years. It's a very dangerous moment dissolution of the European project. It's not some, you know, it's one of those things that uh, if it breaks down, it's not going to be easy to put it back together. You know, if it breaks down, you can't reinvent it again in that way. It's a very dangerous moment.
Well, may, may I interact for once? We, we will strongly disagree. Okay. Because I think it's typically, typically a question of the UK speaking to the UK about the European Union. It has nothing to do with what happened to these elections. These elections are not at all what your press is saying. It's absolutely minuscule, the number of people who are sent. They don't change the, the equilibrium just because UK and France, and so I'm saying France also because that's fascinating because France is even more, but UK and France are not the European Union, not. So it's only because they, we are so big power that everything happening to us happened to the world. Maybe not. Look at Spain. Spain arrived. How many indignators are coming into the European Parliament? Well, as much as you keep. They are unimportant. They think that they are so important, and all the media think that they are so important, that nobody look at the structure of the game. So instead of looking at their ideology, if we look at the structure of the game, what's going on? How many people have been have voted for this kind of logic? Five, six member states. You can always say, oh, it's terrible, it's five, six member states. I think the same. But five, six is not 28. So what is the danger? It's just to go on their side to say it's a huge transformation. It's enormous. And then they will say, yes, and so you have to do a lot of reform immediately. Break down the European Union immediately, because if you don't do it yourself, we will do it. Be racist immediately, because if you don't do it, we will be. We will do that. And so you lead the agenda. And if you say, no, you are minuscule, you are just minimally interesting. You may bring in some questions, but they are wrong questions. And so, I, I know it's a different politics. Uh, there we are speaking about politics, but I was, I was just wanting to insist that we may have different positions and that we need, if we speak European Union, we need to think what is done for 28 countries and not for one country. Mm. For sure. Me, sorry, can Rob just come in as well? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, I think this is, very, this is a very interesting discussion. I, I certainly agree that this is a moment of tremendous importance for the future of Europe, A. And I agree, B, that we shouldn't mistake what happened in Britain and France for what happened in Europe. I, I yeah. indeed was making this point to a number of journalists immediately after and they said, oh my God, there's been this lurch to the right. And I said, no, there hasn't. The, 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 these parties have gone down in support in as many countries as they've gone up. And they're insignificant in most of the countries in Europe. But where I would disagree is to then draw the conclusion that therefore they are completely or, 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 or of marginal um, importance. Because what I think is important with old political structures, structures built up over decades that are quite rickety and involving a lot of compromises like the EU, potentially fragile, is that if you break a precedent, the consequences of that are very unpredictable. The reason that in Spain the political elite are so anxious about what happens in Scotland is because it breaks a precedent. No Western European country in the European Union has broken up. And that, that once that precedent is broken, how does that change Spanish politics? Nobody <coughs> knows, but they're tremendously anxious about that to return to the theme of anxiety. If Britain leaves the EU, the EU will probably carry on. There will still be 27 countries in the EU and several eager to join. But how it affects EU politics is impossible to predict because it breaks the precedent. This would be the first time someone had actually opted <coughs> to leave. And we don't know how that changes the politics in other countries. Five or six years ago, if you were to say that Finland, of all places, would be elected 20% of its MPs from a party that was openly rejecting the EU, that would have been really <coughs> ludicrous, but it happened. Yep. You don't know how yep. setting that precedent will change mm -hmm. politics elsewhere in the yep. EU. I, mean, I take Didier's point, but I thought the point being made was something to do with the loss of in the direction of the European movement. 
the, the which finds the loss of social Europe in yeah. favour yeah. of neoliberal so, Europe. Yeah, 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 yeah. and it, so it, supposedly it socialist. finds it, it finds all sorts of expression in different community members, electorally and so on, driven by their own local conditions. So I didn't actually have in mind UKIP. I didn't have in mind, I did, and that wasn't how I interpreted your no, point. No, you're right. Uh, when you made your point. Um, it, it's something to do yeah, with the loss of direction of the institutions themselves. And, and that, that social idea, yeah. which is a political idea uh, <coughs> of your... Uh. Once again, do you think social... If we continue, do, do you think social Europe has disappeared from the agenda, or on the contrary, in Germany, social Europe is even more on the agenda than ever. But I at, at, at what point? Well, at what point you have uh, a minimum wage? At what point you have a new discussion that well, if the UK leave, finally the. Uh, the German, the Dutch, and the French can do finally something together because the, the, it was blocked by uh, just the unanimity that we, we go federal and so what. So, so you have a lot of possibilities. That, what would be, uh, it, it's interesting time on both sides. It's not the loss of something. It's that we will have conflicting discussion which, which have been lost by this logic of unanimity. Can I answer that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, 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 really, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> I really hope you are right that if the UK leaves, then the rest of Europe can get on with a social project. But we are living in times of austerity, and the austerity agenda is being driven by the demands of the right and neoliberal banking, ECB, and commission <laughs> almost a takeover by the right of the social Europe agenda. A little bit like the Liberal Democrat Party here were victims of a right-wing coup when they entered coalition. I fear something happening like this in terms of the ascendancy of neoliberalism within the European project. Nobody from Germany would intervene. Uh, <laughs> well, maybe, but you don't. Somebody from Greece might. Somebody, oh, oh, Greece. Might, somebody from. So there, there was another question for me that I forgot to answer. <laughs> so I was wondering really really if I could answer. Yeah. It. Okay. Um, yeah. So the question of UKIP and, and immigration, and you know whether or not uh, portraying UKIP as, as as rebels potentially is misleading, because in fact what they're doing is is often foreshadowed by a lot of what's been going on in mainstream politics. I think on immigration, that's that's quite correct. Um, there's, there's a lot to that argument. Um, we've seen anti-immigration rhetoric in mainstream British politics for 50 years, really, and from the Conservative Party in particular, going all the way back to, to Thatcher. Um, but I would say two things to just sort of nuance that. The, the first is, you've got to get the ordering right on this, I think, a little bit. The disaffection of these voters that UKIP are appealing to, which is the reason that they've become willing to back a new political party that on other issues such as economics are completely opposed to their interests. I mean, these are Thatcherites, and you know, you've got working class voters backing a Thatcherite party that basically wants to take away from them what little they currently get in assistance from the state. Um, that disaffection that has produced that almost ir irrational response predates the current debate over immigration. You see it in the turnout slumps of 97 and 2001. You see it in all of the long-term survey data where you see these voters becoming steadily more hostile to the political system, even before the immigration issue burst onto the scene. And in fact, you can say this is part of the reason that the immigration issue did become so powerful, because it provided these voters who were already upset with the system with a scapegoat. Um, you know, with someone to blame for their feeling of loss and their feeling that they no longer were represented. And the other thing I would say about it is that it can't entirely be laid at the door of the media and the Conservative Party, though they do definitely play a role, because if you look at other countries in Europe where these parties have emerged, you see countries where they have been just as successful, just as powerful, despite a pretty much full-bore rejection of all of that kind of narrative and, and politics by the entire political class and most of the media class as well. Uh, cases like Belgium and uh, the Netherlands, when the, these parties burst on the scene in those countries, at that stage, the political class said, absolutely no. Uh, after that, they did move in that direction too, unfortunately. 
But it doesn't seem that, you know, uh, the, the sort of cordon sanitaire approach that was often popular on the left 20 years really seems to be viable. Why it's not viable is an interesting question, but it does suggest that this is not just something that has been, as it were, it's not a monster created by mainstream politics alone. It's a monster that seems to be partly the result of people being left out of mainstream politics. Just, just a, a, a minor remark. It's not a, it's not a member state leaving the EU, but one country left the EU. Greenland left in 1982. Uh, okay, so I promise I wouldn't. I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't keep on marking. Anyway, the stereotypical servant boy, angry about uh, the geopolitics of stuff. But there is one thing that unites the world. And I suppose it is wherever you are, you discuss Europe. And <laughs> <laughs> I understand how the situation is quite particular with the elections, but the only thing that struck me, and believe me, I'm very uncomfortable by, by, by playing this role here, being the voice from the south, but <laughs> is why do we need Europe to give us hope? Because that was the connection. <laughs> and isn't it, don't we have now a brilliant opportunity to get rid of European <laughs> projects and start thinking of the world as such yeah. instead? And I mean, I, 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 I beg your pardon if I sound overly angry about this, it's just blood if you like, <laughs> but it's, it is, it's, very, it's, it's just very interesting, it is, it's, it's interesting this connection, we need Europe to provide us hope, why? Uh, I'm not sure that the hope that, that was being talked about there, mm. as it were, was for the rest of the world, and it isn't so much what Europe's got to offer the rest of the world, as the point came out, I understood it to be, Europe has a legacy in the 20th century especially, of widespread, widespread internecine strife, racism, and mass murder. And that's a very lively history. The fear is of, of in some way, that coming back in some form or expression of another. And so it's very, it's very solipsistic. It's to do, yeah. you know, it's to do with a kind of, it's to do with Europe's history, as you pointed out, and because the 
the issue was the matter of the times of anxiety, in the business of time. What time? You know, Machiavelli says, you know, the key question is, what times are these in which we live? And if you can read the signs of the times, then, then you can know what to do. And the problem is always, of course, <laughs> what times are these in which we live? Sometimes that is question is kind of posed and answered without too much anxiety. These days it seems to me to be a very, very lively issue. And you can't pose that question without thinking of the past, as well as the present and the future. That's the way it arose. <laughs> if I came from the South, I'd have no hope in Europe at all. <laughs> but, but for the Europeans, that's, that's, that's the mixture of, uh, of cocktail of uh, concern. Are there any other perhaps comments final comments? Yeah, I'll Maybe just one um, adding on the question whether one member state leaving the union would be crazy soon. I think we should have to remind ourselves that the UK leaving the, United, the European Union is not just one member state, but 60 something, almost 70 million people leaving the European Union and the European project, um, which makes this question of whether it's a dangerous precedent or not much more important because um, <laughs> you could say, um, that the low turnout in the European elections, Europe-wide, is a sign that people are not that important, but that it's states. But I would argue, um, being a convinced federalist, <laughs> on the long term, it has to become a project of the people and not only of the states, otherwise it won't work. And I don't know whether this is possible, but we have to work into this direction. And therefore, um, adding a bit to what Sigmund Bauman was telling about, um, we have to engage with our adversaries. I think European policy makers now have to engage not only with, I totally agree, not only with the UK um, electorate, but with the electorate um, in Europe in general. And that is of mm. utmost importance. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Would it be unfair to say that from a certain perspective, the problem with the European Union now is it looks a bit like FIFA? <laughs> Yes, no, it's unfair. It's unfair. It's unfair. Right. It's unfair. Right. 24 <laughs> hours away from the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the next, next that time. was my point. I don't know. Do you want to get any final remarks, quick remarks? Could I uh, just yeah. quickly rea react to that? Um, I, I get an interesting perspective on this because my wife is Polish and uh, her mother-in-law is a history professor at Krakow University, so I read a lot of Polish history in the course of my courtship. It was an obligatory part of the process. Um, so I see it now from the Eastern sort of perspective as well as the West perspective, and that, that, that is interesting because coming back to this point about, you know, from Britain, I think the EU does look like FIFA. It seems rather corrupt. There's an awful lot of uh, noise and, uh, and nonsense. We sort of are a founding part of it, but we never do well, uh, and the Germans always win. Um, uh, there you go. On penalty. <laughs> but from <Yeah>. Poland, <laughs> from Poland, it doesn't look like that yeah. at all. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. when you've got such a blood-soaked history as Poland does, any project that holds out the prospect of increased cooperation <laughs> and reduced mm -hmm. violence mm -hmm. is tremendously valuable. And Britain's status as an island that's been able to essentially opt out of Europe's wars and only take part when necessary. I mean, Orwell made a very good point when he said Britain never had a standing army before the 1930s, and you can't understand British politics without knowing that. You can't understand Britain's relation to the EU without knowing that. Every other country in Europe had to have a standing army because the guys next door were going to have one, and they're going to come after you. I mean, the list of people who invaded Poland, it's, it's like a laundry list. It's everyone, even the Swedes had a go. Um, you know, so no wonder there's this tremendous, in Central and Eastern Europe, this tremendous attraction to a project that says no more of that. But it's very hard to communicate that to the British because it's not their history at all. Yeah. You know, which is why I would have some sympathy with Maya's point that well, maybe they'd be better off without the British. Well, maybe, yeah. Um, but I'm not necessarily endorsing the point. I'm yeah.
But maybe one little point also, which is uh, I discussed with some bankers at the ECB, uh, and well, it was in a in a meeting at the a think tank, and they were a couple of them, and when. You had this question about the opt-out of the UK. They say, but they just can't. They can politically, but they sold their countries economically. That's it. So the only question is, how is it possible? For them, the question was, these politicians in the UK, they are so good. They succeed that the people listening to them continue to believe that they, they, they can have a say on what is going on in the UK. And they were asking me, you, you as professor in the UK, could you explain to me what's going on? How is it possible that these politicians are so successful? Because of course that's a divorce between the force of economy and this idea of a nationalist opt-out. And that's really what, on the other side, uh, you have plenty of people who. But it's not that's just really uh, extraordinary. Yeah. We cannot do that. We we have no possibilities. And I, I know that I'm playing a little bit sh shocking line here, but that's really something which is really important. So I, I'm just going to say something that both my French, uh, sorry, my British and Polish halves would agree with, which is that it's a little bit unfair to say that only the British play the nationalist opt-out card. We've been trying to get reform of the common agricultural policy in Europe for 30 years, oh, no, and the only country that blocks no. it over and over again mm. is the French. <laughs> <laughs> right? Well, it was not my point, you know. It but was that's, not that's my half point. The EU I'm budget, not a so French nationalist. I'm, uh, I'm everything a except that. that. They? they get a second-class yeah. citizen share, which they're really annoyed about because the French would hand it over. Bashing the French is not an option. As you as you you started, um, well, basically you brought up the the issue of uh, reading anxiety, perhaps in a more positive or more hopeful way. <laughs> Yet it seems that the Tyrant table was about that, Europe, that went well. There is hope. Yeah. There is no hope. Uh, perhaps uh, your final reflection on why we should read uh, anxiety as like a perhaps more positive, hopeful way of engaging with and changing the political. Why should we do that? Yes, why? But what else should we do? <laughs> how, should that, that, how should we do it? <laughs> but why? How? How? When? When how? is anxiety? <laughs> yeah. Um, by not succumbing to strict categories. That's what I think. Thank you. Right. Um, on this note, uh, should we bring this conference to a close? Uh, I mean, really, thank you very much uh, for coming and for, I mean, really presenting uh, your work, uh, sharing your work with us. I think it was been, it's been, um, I think we have had a three really, really productive and, and interesting days of, uh, days of discussion. Um, can we now also, um, can you join me in thanking uh, the, the, the panelists for this final um, round table? But just before we do that, um, we're going to the pub, yeah? We can do that, yeah, that's, that's all right. But there is potentiality in this. <laughs> there we go. This is the first step into a more positive engagement with uh, anxiety. Uh, so we're going to go by um, just straight after this, uh, after this uh, round table. And I mean, please do join us if you, if you can. Uh, no, please join me.